Hello, welcome to Socialist Action Webcasts. This is webcast number two in the new 2024 series. My name is Elizabeth Weiss. I'm the treasurer of Socialist Action and a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus. I'm the past executive secretary of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council. We acknowledge that this event is taking place on indigenous lands across Turtle Island known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Wendat, and Audenoshawnee people in a place called Toronto. Today, I'm speaking to you from Jamaica, where the indigenous Taino and Arawak speaking people began arriving 4,000 years ago. They were wiped out by the European colonial powers. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Now we present tonight's topic. Does Canada back the Zionist state and genocide? Featuring Rowan Navelle of the Palestine Youth Movement, Eve Engler of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and Tamara Lawrence of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. Our speakers will speak 15 to 20 minutes each, and then answer some questions from the audience. So let's welcome our first speaker. Rowan Nivelle is a community organizer with the Palestine Youth Movement. You have the floor, Rowan. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you for inviting us here today. My name is Rowan Nabil. I'm an organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement. And just to kind of give um, a background about what the Palestinian Youth Movement is, it is a transnational grassroots and independent movement of Palestinian and Arab youth that are fighting for the liberation of our homelands from Zionism and imperialism. And so we really strongly believe in our role in the Afar diaspora to really mobilize our communities, to stand firm with our people in Palestine as they struggle against Zionism's crimes. And we know that when our people rise up in Palestine um, and in countries across the Arab world, we also rise up in the locations where we live. And we must always demonstrate that, you know, Palestinians are committed to our people's liberation from Zionist colonization and that we have never and we will never abandon our righteous cause or our people. Um, historically and today, We've seen that the diaspora has played a really pivotal role in popular mobilization. So we're mobilizing our communities wherever they exist to advance the struggle in Palestine. And we really seek to build community power wherever we are. So we really want to be able to engage um, and build strong community relationships that are unified through action in service of our people and our struggle. And the Palestinian youth movement also upholds the rights of the Palestinian people to resist colonial domination and racist occupation. And we reject the framing that really reduces us to victims of colonial violence alone. Our role in the far diaspora and for all those who support the struggle of oppressed um, people for liberation is to really rise in this moment of courage and join our voices with people that are literally all over the world to really break free from the shackles of colonialism and imperialism. And we've seen over the last five months now um, that the Palestinian youth movement and other groups have really mobilized across 14 cities that are in the US, Canada, and Britain that have brought hundreds of thousands, if not millions in Britain, for example, um, millions of people into the streets and condemning Israel's genocidal campaign in Gaza and to stand with the brave people of Gaza. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a grounding on uh, what has been happening in Gaza and then I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the rise of the resistance and the popular cradle. So obviously right now we are entering 150 days of this assault on Gaza and this genocide on Gaza. And we've seen since October 7th, over 30,000 Palestinians have been martyred. And we've seen that almost every five minutes, there's a Palestinian that is martyred. And we also know that in the West Bank, there are over hundreds of Palestinians, mainly youth that have been martyred and incarcerated and we also see this with mass arrests of Palestinians all over historic Palestine 
adding to the nearly hundreds of administrative detainees that have been detained without charge. And at this moment, um, there are over 10,000 Palestinians held in Zionist prisons. And this doesn't include the hundreds of workers from Gaza who were kidnapped and then released um, after October 7th that were held and tortured all across Palestine. And so in Gaza, we see that obviously the Zionist enemy has dropped over thousands of tons of bombs on entire residential complexes, hospitals, schools, places of worship, telecommun telecommunication lines. There has been total blackouts in Gaza since you know the beginning of October, and it has just been increasing. So something that we have been consistently talking about is that during mid-November, um, there was an average of 33 tons of explosives that were dropped per square kilometer, and that amounts to essentially more than the tonnage of nuclear bombs that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the U.S. government. And so we're seeing Israel continue to carry out war crimes daily with the direct help of Western imperialist governments that have been targeting journalists, medics, civilians, and any of these supposedly safe roads or safe areas that are pushing Palestinians and ethnically cleansing Palestinians more so towards the Rafah border crossing or more so towards um, trying to push them into Egypt. Um, we've seen this and this is obviously backed by U.S. imperialist forces as well as Canada in many ways, which we can also talk about um, in a bit. So. Obviously, we've seen, you know, entire generations of families being wiped out, and, and this is by far the deadliest um, assault on Gaza, and we've seen, you know, genocidal campaigns in 2009, 2012, 2014. There's been a total of six wars on Gaza since 2005, but this has been the deadliest, and this is the deadliest across um, the history of Palestine. But I think it's important to remember that at the same time across the world, we've obviously seen mass outpouring of people. They've taken to the streets to show their support for Palestine. We are seeing now that there is a global movement for Palestine. And, you know, there's millions that have been gathering in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Egypt, to the hundreds of thousands across Europe, the Americas and the UK, Italy. And... Obviously, despite the repression that we are facing, even here in Canada, um, thousands have been gathered in in to take the streets and take up, um, you know, showing their support, even even when we are being, um, you know, continuously repressed by state violence. And we've obviously seen, um, in contrast, there has been, you know, barely a handful of the, like protests for so-called Israel. Um, and the majority of support has been really concentrated amongst the ruling classes. Um, and this reveals really more clearly every single day that, you know, we have the truth on our side and that, you know, we are waging a people's war and it's a struggle for oppressed peoples, a struggle for all revolutionaries, for all people who seek true liberation and justice from the forces of Zionism and global imperialism. And, you know, Israel is really able to launch a relentless bombing campaign against the people of Gaza with complete impunity. And it's enjoying, um, and it essentially enjoys the political, diplomatic, and military support of the US, Can Canadian, and British governments, as well as the European Union. Um, but we have seen that, you know, the majority of the world is on our side. And we, this is really a mass movement. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about maybe having a little bit of more thorough understanding of how um, we talk about Palestine in general. And we tend to talk about Palestine in a more materialist framework as opposed to an idealist framework. I just wanna give a little bit of a breakdown of that. So when we're talking about an idealist framework, um, when we're talking about Palestine, it's like what we hear in mainstream media that is really, you know, manufacturing consent for this genocide. So we hear things from CBC or CTV um, that argues, you know, Israelis and Palestinians just can't get along because of the differences in like core values or ideology between two people. Um, or we hear narratives that this is like a timeless um, religious conflict between Jews and Muslims, or this is a fight between authoritarianism versus democracy or any of these things. These are very idealist understandings 
of um, how we're talking about Palestine. But when we come to a very materialist understanding um, or framework, we are rooting ourselves and understanding that the genocide that we are witnessing today is because of a historical struggle over land, over resources. This is, of course, related um, and part and parcel of imperialist interests and ge geopolitical goals in the region. And through this materialist framework, we can understand the objective reality that both historically and today in Palestine and the resistance and the Palestinian Arab masses are historical and political agents. And so when we're even understanding Zionism, we're understanding it as a product of, imp of European imperialism, which is um, driving a settler colonial project in Palestine. So we can understand um, through this materialist framework that change can only come through a struggle between colonized peoples and their colonizers. And so when we're thinking about Gaza in particular, we need to also understand that Gaza is under siege. It has been under siege for over 16 years because of the people of Gaza choose to resist. And when we're thinking about choosing to resist, we're understanding also that the people of Gaza are really shouldering the largest burden for our collective liberation. And there is no amount of collective punishment by the Zionist entity that will bend or break the will of our people in Gaza to live in dignity and freedom on their liberated land. And so obviously we know Gaza is described often as an open air prison. And of course it is because we have seen the material conditions and the siege that Gaza has been under for over 16 years. And we know that the people of Gaza are the greatest victims of the Zionist terrorist state. But we also know that they are truly the greatest heroes. And um, Gaza is not simply really a site of catastrophe. Gaza is the heart of the liberation struggle. Gaza is the pulse of our resistance across Palestine. And Gaza holds the popular cradle of the struggle. And I want to come to the understanding of the popular cradle and really something that we want to push within the Palestinian youth movement is really to raise the consciousness um, around resistance and how we understand resistance and our right to resist. So the popular cradle, particularly within Palestinian political literature, really refers to the popular base of support within Palestinian society for the Palestinian liberation struggle. So just to give a simple um, translation in Arabic, the popular cradle is called al-hadin al-shabiyya. And when we're thinking about al-hadin al-shabiyya, it literally, almost literally translates to the hug of the people or the hug of the crowd, that kind of thing. So when we're thinking about al-hadin al-shabiyya or the popular cradle, we're thinking almost as if um, Palestine is hugging, you know, the resistance and the resistance is hugging Palestine. And we're, when I say Palestine, um, the Palestinian people. So it's kind of a relationship where um, there is trust and reciprocity between um, how we understand our right to resist and that we have uh, a duty in order to liberate our land and liberate our people. And so really when we're understanding the popular creedal, it's the organ, it's the beating heart, by which Palestinian resistance is carried out against the Zionist enemy. And we've seen obviously, you know, Israel's massacres in Gaza, and we've seen the total destruction um, of almost all of its infrastructure. I think at this point, it's around like 80% of its infrastructure. And this is really also an attempt to break the popular cradle to really destroy the beating heart of our struggle. And we've seen this, um, this particular approach to break the, the popular cradle and the military approach um, that is expressed in Israel in the Israeli army's Dahya doctrine, which was a doctrine that um, was utilized in the 2006 war on Lebanon. And it essentially deals with um, asymmetrical combat against an enemy that is not a regular army and it's embedded within a civilian population. So according to this doctrine, essentially, that was again formed in 2006 um, during the uh, Israeli war on Lebanon, Israel has to employ tremendous force disproportionate to the magnitude of the enemy's actions. So as a result, the Dahi doctrine is really 
um, an intent by Israel to target civilian infrastructure and civilian populations in order to apply stress and pressure on the people so that they, were, they will turn on the authorities which essentially control the territory. And we know obviously, just like I mentioned, that Gaza plays a very critical role in resistance and it explains um, why Gaza is being attacked so indiscriminately right now. Um, and when we're thinking about, you know, the goals of the siege or the bombings, um, it really was never to eliminate Hamas, but it's to completely destroy Gaza and it's to completely um, subjugate um, Palestinians to genocide. And so the genocide we're seeing is not only, um, it's not informed only by Zionist reaction to the events of October 7th, but it's a continuation of an ongoing genocidal Zionist project which has had um, as its you know, self-stated aims, nothing short of total elimination of Palestinian people and the seizing of all Arab lands in general. And we've seen that with the Zionist occupation of um, South Lebanon for over 20 years. And so um, when we're thinking about, you know, why is this being greenlighted? Um, is it being funded by Western governments? Um, it really goes back to the relationship between Zionism and imperialism that I briefly discussed. Um, and so when we're thinking even about, you know, the Palestinian resistance, which is really composed of colonized peoples who rise up against their colonizers throughout of all of Palestine, they are really posing a threat, not just to Israel, but they are posing a threat to world imperialism. And so we're seeing that, you know, the US government, for instance, is directly funding um, this genocide and we are seeing the Canadian government um, funding it in different ways or arming it in different ways. And so I know that other folks on the panel will also um, be speaking to those different pieces. And I think just to kind of uh, end off the section, you know, our duty here in Canada or generally speaking in the Imperial Corps is to really combat um, narratives um, of like, um, victimhoods and also narratives that, you know, this is not a genocide or anything like that. We need to really, we are facing a huge um, war of ideas or an ideological battle that we are consistently up against. So we have a really big role to play. And as we know right now, Canada um, has an arms deal with Israel that has funded its genocide um, to the tune of $21 million. Um, and this is in 2022. So it includes aircraft surveillance technology. And we're seeing that obviously our tax dollars are being used to directly fund the destruction of homes and the killings of Palestinians. And again, Canada tends to send, um, tends to make weapons parts and then send them to the US. And we can get into those, that relationship of what Canada and how Canada is complicit. And um, I think just to kind of end off and on a note of the fact that we have a really big role to play here in so-called Canada. We have a really big role to demand that our government is no longer complicit in Israeli war crimes. And we need to demand that there is an end to Canadian institutions, complicities um, in this genocide. And we know that for instance, Scotiabank invests over $500 million in deadly arms manufacturers like Elbit Systems. Um, and we know that just recently, the Trudeau government authorized um, a permits for $28.5 million, um, like military export permits. And so we're really seeing an increasing number of ways that Canada is complicit. And we've seen this historically as well. So I think it's something really important to note and to take away is that we have a huge role to play. Um, and we have a huge role to um, put pressure on our governments to achieve an arms embargo. And the idea that you know, they passed a ceasefire or a ceasefire motion was already um, granted is is not, it's, it's very symbolic because at the end of the day, if we are going to achieve ceasefire, then that means that we need to ultimately put pressure on the government to actualize and materialize an arms embargo. Um, but yes, thank you so much folks for um, listening to me and I will pass it on uh, to you, Elizabeth. Okay, hey, thank you very much for one. Our next speaker, second speaker, is Eve Engler. He's the author of over a dozen books on foreign policy, including Building Apartheid, Canada and Africa, 
Stand on Guard for Whom? A Propaganda System. His latest book, Canada's Long Fight Against Democracy, will be featured at an essay book launch at OISE U of T, Toronto, on Tuesday, March the 26th. Eve resides in Montreal and is a leading member of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Welcome again, Eve. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks to Socialist Action for putting this on. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I thought I would start with um, um, some history um, to the question of like, does Canada support the genocide? Of course it does. Uh, and it, 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 it has supported Palestinian dispossession for, uh, for more, than a, more than a century. Uh, so Zionism in Canada begins at the time, around the time of Confederation. There's a Christian Zionist movement that begins that basically melds the, the um, more literal readings of the Bible that come out of the Protestant Reformation with uh, the growing British geostrategic interest in the region after Britain took control of, of the Suez uh, Canal in the 1800s, uh, early 1880s. And so Canada has this Zionist kind of ethos that flows out in large part of its uh, connection to the British Empire. So um, Henry Wentworth Monk, who is the first prominent Canadian Zionist, um, he, he called for a dominion of uh, Israel as part of the British Empire, just like Canada was a dominion of the British Empire, New Zealand, Australia, that Palestine would be that within um, a confederation of the other with the other dominions. So there's a long history. Uh, uh, if you go into the, the actual conquering of, of Palestine and Gaza, there was a, a Canadian general, uh, 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 Dobell, who had led the uh, uh, British uh, French uh, occupation of uh, the German territories in West Africa during World War I. He, he uh, oversaw um, the British and French rule there. He, he later lead, leads a mission to conquer Gaza. That's unsuccessful. Uh, about 400 Canadians fought with the uh, Allenby, the British general, when they conquered Palestine. And, and um, Canada, as its foreign policy was under the um, British, that there was legal opinion that the Balfour Declaration was actually that Canada uh, adhered to the Balfour Declaration, which of course gave the, the land of Palestinians to the uh, European uh, uh, Zionist movement. The British stated that that was the case. Um, so there's a history and there's lots of fundraising. If you look at early 1900s, particularly after the Balfour Declaration, there's lots of fundraising in Canada for the colonization process in Palestine. Canada, Canada of course, is a relatively wealthy uh, country. So there's lots of fundraising that goes on. And the most important historic Canadian contribution to Palestinian dispossession was in, in uh, 1947 with the UN partition plan. And when the British handed their mandate uh, to the UN to come up with a solution, the Canadian uh, Supreme Court Justice Ivan C. Rand, well, first of all, I should say, the, in the initial committees at the UN to come up with what became the United, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, uh, Canadian diplomats, specifically Lester Pearson, played an important role in trying to frame the UN um, body that would go to Palestine from a pro-Zionist perspective. Then uh, Ivan C. Rand, Canadian Supreme Court Justice, who was part of the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine that went to the region to come up with a solution. Uh, this is, of course, was something that Palestinians rejected. Basically, why should some Canadian Supreme Court Justice and uh, official from Guatemala and official from uh, uh, other European countries, why should they come up with a solution to our territory, our land. You know, this is our land. We, we are the indigenous people and give us independence. That was the basic Palestinian position, which uh, a, a pretty reasonable one in my, in my mind. Um, but, but Ivan C. Rand, the Keynes Supreme Court Justice, came up with a very, uh, promoted a very um, aggressive uh, support for partitioning, which was to create a, a, a Jewish state 
on uh, territory that was uh, not predominantly Jewish and um, and push for a, a, the a very big um, uh, amount of Palestinian land to the Zionist movement. And so the partition plan um, gave 55% historic Palestine to the Zionist movement, despite the Jewish population being le less than a third and owning uh, about 7% of the land. And this was, of course, opposed by Palestinians. And most of the, the Jewish population was, had, you know, was fairly recent uh, uh, immigrants uh, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the area. And um, this was, of course, uh, opposed by the Palestinians. But again, the, uh, Lester Pearson played an important role in the UN discussions in promoting the partition plan, and specifically in getting the US and uh, Soviets uh, in agreement on the partition plan that the Palestinians were rejecting. And, and Pearson was clear, he, really, he didn't care about the interests of, of, of Palestinians. He was concerned about division between Washington and London on the question, but really wasn't concerned about uh, uh, the impact on, on Palestinians. And the concrete impact was the partition plan gave the Zionist movement the legitimacy to, um, to ethnically cleanse, to, to drive out Palestinians and, and uh, uh, de-Arabize, if you like, um, historic uh, Palestine. And there were Canadians that fought, that helped in that. There were hundreds of Canadians that uh, helped the Zionist forces. The initial uh, uh, Zionist uh, Israeli Air Force was led by a Canadian, and it was pr principally World War II Canadian veterans that um, that were the in the Air Force. They were they I forget the number, but a quarter of the Air Force was Canadians, um, uh, and there was hundreds of Canadians that led uh, uh, battalions and stuff like that in the ethnic cleansing. Most famously, uh, Ben Dunkelman, uh, the the uh, heir to Tip Top Tailors, in um, in uh, in Toronto, and. Um, so, so Canada played, you know, important role from the get-go. Canada supported Zionism, uh, supported the creation of Israel and and the ethnic ethnic cleansing of Palestinians that that um, uh, entailed. Uh, fast forward, and and you know, throughout after Israel's creation, Canada's support was you know um, continued. There's varying degrees at different points. I'll, I'll talk about a couple of, of of important ones that don't get talked about much. There's a whole uh, business for decades where Canadian uh, diplomats basically turned a blind eye to the fact that uh, the Mossad was using Canadian passports to assassinate people internationally. That includes uh, one infamous example where they mistaken, there was a mistaken um, identity and they killed uh, somebody in uh, Norway in, uh, I think it was in 74. And then the, the one that really went back on Canadian officials was when they poisoned uh, uh, Khalil Mashal, the head of uh, Hamas in uh, 97 in Jordan. And uh, the Jordanians caught the, uh, the Israeli agents and they forced um, them to provide the antidote to the poison that would ultimately uh, save his life. And that was done on Canadian uh, passport. That actually led to a bit of a diplomatic row with, with Israel. But for, for many, many years, the, the preferred passport that Mossad um, did its a lot of its dirty international dealings was with Canadian passports. And, you know, we don't we can't have this like confirmed 100 percent, but basically Canadian officials sort of seem to have gone along with this. Um, that's kind of an interesting one. The other the other part <clears throat> and bringing the, us up to today is the whole fundraising question. And so since Canada adopted uh, registered charity status in, in, in 1967, um, there's something in the range of five, six, maybe as high as $10 billion that have been raised uh, by registered charities in Canada for projects in Israel. And this doesn't get hardly any attention, but in my mind, it's the most important Canadian contribution uh, to Palestinian dispossession. And so basically, uh, today, it's about a quarter billion dollars a year. It, just since October 7th, we it's like over 100 million. There was a bunch of fundraisers in the initial weeks right after. Huge amounts of money uh, that were raised, over 100 million for projects in Israel. And, and that's, that's consistent, right? After the 67 war, uh, 73 
whenever Israel is violent, uh, there's big uh, growth of fundraising uh, for projects uh, supporting Israel in, in Canada, historically. Um, so the the fundraising is, is, in my opinion, the biggest contribution to Canadian dis, uh, uh, Palestinian dispossession. And <clears throat> there's, there's all kinds of elements. It's, it's actually remarkable. Hundreds of groups in Canada that raise fund projects in Israel. And basically, those are subsidized by the taxpayer because depending on your tax bracket, but as much as like 40% of that is a, a tax write-off that, you know, obviously the wealthier you are, the bigger the, um, uh, the uh, donation, um, uh, big, bigger the subsidy from the taxpayer. And so a lot of this money goes to projects that support the Israeli military, uh, actually in contravention of Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency rules. Money goes to projects that support uh, the, Hesek, the Hesek Foundation, with Jerry Schwartz and Heather Reisman is the preeminent example. They raised about $9 million a year to basically uh, promote non-Israelis joining the Israeli military. But there's a number of other projects supporting the Israeli military. Uh, the, the, there's projects supporting uh, settlements in the West Bank. That, that also is in, ostensibly in contravention of Canada Revenue Agency rules. And there's projects, money going to charities uh, supporting racist organizations in Israel, even though the Canada Revenue Agency has uh, guidelines that say that it's supposed to uphold anti-racist uh, uh, principles. So there's this, this Canadian, massive Canadian financial contribution uh, to uh, projects in Israel that gets really under-discussed, uh, even though it's an important part of, of Canada's support for, for Israel. Um, there's also the whole question of Canadians fighting in the Israeli military and, and other projects like Sarel that support the Israeli military. And according to the Foreign Enlistment Act, it's illegal to induce Canadians to join any other country's military. And yet there are schools, there are, there's Israeli uh, consul in Toronto uh, that have um, promoted Canadians joining the Israeli military in contravention of Foreign Enlistment Act but the RCMP has basically refused to, to take action. Uh, a group like Sarel basically brings hundreds of Canadian volunteers to Israel every year to, to uh, help out on bases. They're usually there for like three weeks, a month, and they basically do ostensibly civilian tasks. So they do things um, that uh, ostensibly civilian tax, but tasks, but sometimes it means like cleaning guns and tanks and helping out with stuff like that. Um, there's so this is also uh, you know part of Canada's contribution uh, to Palestinian dispossession. Um, you know if you look at just the Trudeau government, some of what the Trudeau government has set up, right? It, it, it set up this this uh, special envoy, supposedly to combat anti-Semitism, uh, but but it's basically just a tool to uh, uh, deter criticism of apartheid and genocide. And that's been made absolutely clear in recent months with Deborah Lyons' uh, uh, actions and, and um, a smearing of Palestine solidarity uh, anti-genocide uh, marches. Uh, so they set this, this position up uh, to promote apartheid. You have things like the Trudeau government going to uh, suing to not have the proper labels on wines sold in the uh, Ontario Liquor Board. Right, they the wines coming from illegal settlements. Um, there was a effort to have they were called products of Israel, and that was challenged. And the Trudeau government literally uh, uh, rejected a, a court decision uh, saying that the you know the the there the should be proper labeling uh, because they don't want Canadians to know where these uh, settlement uh, wines actually come from. Um, there's so it's extreme, you know, Melanie Jolie just, to, you know, yesterday, a couple of days ago, was in Israel, and she said she was there to, um, in solidarity, the word she used, solidarity, you know, as, as a genocide. I don't even, I think genocide is even too, too soft a word. I, I increasingly, this is a holocaust that Israel's committing in Gaza, you know, more than 31,000 killed, uh, and mass starvation. Uh, you know, the mention of what their reaction with regards to permits for arms since, uh, since uh, the genocide began is to speed up the arms permits, right? Now they got it down to four days, right? Usually the bureaucracy works slowly when 
uh, agreeing to arms permits, but they, they, the response to all the killing is to speed up Canadian arms permits to Israel. So the, the Trudeau government, um, you know, we, we thought of, it was clear that Stephen Harper had become extreme pro-Israel, but people, you know, even people in the Palestine Solidarity world often used to talk about honest, Canada being an honest broker. And, and Harper undercut that, that thinking. Um, uh, but he was a conservative, so the idea was he was a, sort of an anomaly or something like that. Well, Trudeau has shown that that's not the case. Canada was never an honest broker. He has always uh, sided with Zionism uh, against Palestinians. Uh, and, and it's important to put that, that, that to rest for a couple of reasons. One, in that it, it doesn't, it, 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 it confuses us about Canadian foreign policy. Canadian foreign policy is not benevolent. Uh, anywhere in the world. It's about supporting empire, corporate interests. In the case of Palestine, I think there's important uh, uh, domestic Israel lobby, mostly uh, Jewish uh, Zionist uh, lobbying that contributes as well. But historically, you know, around the world, Canada supports empire, supports corporate interests. Um, so it confuses, confuses us about Canadian foreign policy, but it also it, it confuses us about why Palestinians have been uh, dispossessed. Okay, Palestinians have been dispossessed not because uh, uh, the the you know Zionist movement has 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 succeeded in different ways and that you know obviously contributes, but it's because the Zionist movement has had was you know was sponsored by British imperialism and was strengthened and 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 emboldened and and enabled by British imperialism and then U.S. empire and Canada has been has had a has a uniquely close relationship. To the British and U.S. empires, and um, it's done a lot to enable this European colonial movement to succeed in uh, in dispossessing uh, uh, Palestinians. Now, just to, to finish off on um, you know what's going on in Gaza is kind of hard to to wrap your head around. I, I, people, I, I think, probably may have seen this graph that there's more children killed in Gaza in the past five months as in all other wars over the past four years, right? And, and, and that is stat in of itself is, is wild. But then when you actually think about like population, it's even crazier, right? Like there's like 2.2, 2.4 maybe million people in, in Gaza, but like there's been 570, I think, or something like that, uh, kids killed in, in Ukraine over the past two years. But Ukraine is like a country of like 35, 40 million people. Uh, you know, Sudan, other places where there's been people, uh, kids killed, much, much bigger places. So when you actually think about the intensity of the violence and the intensity of the destruction and, and you know, the, the intensity of the killing of children, it's just it's just absolutely, you know, um, hard to, to even kind of process. Uh, but 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 as horrible as, as that is. Uh, the 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 silver lining in all of this is that this is the biggest uh, popular uprising on in international affairs that I've ever seen. Uh, this is now five months here in Montreal. Every weekend there's been a demonstration. Uh, every single one of those, except for last week, was over a uh, thousand people. The biggest one, fifty thousand people. There have been. I just came from a, a, a picket. It was about a hundred people. Uh, the Liberal Party fundraiser in Old Montreal, about 100 people uh, in 24 hours notice. Um, it, there were supposed to be seven ministers. All we saw only confirmed one minister ended up entering. We don't know if Melanie Jolie or the other ministers came in some other way, but but we had the doors uh, covered. Uh, and there's this, you know, variations of this have been happening all across the country. Tons of disruptions, uh, tons of, 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 of different actions, uh, direct actions, um, uh, this is a remarkable uh, display of international solidarity, and um, um, that's the the I think the you know I just saw just just as I started on Trudeau just announced that he is going to they're going to have some sort of it's not clear I didn't read his story but Toronto Star interview saying he's going to they're going to pause all non lethal uh, or all uh, yeah all non lethal arms uh, uh, permits. Uh, for arms sales to Israel, because they claim it's only non-lethal stuff they're actually sending, which is not true, of course. But but so that's of course, if this is true, this is entirely in reaction to to the mobilizations taking place. It's far from enough. We need to you know uproot the whole system of Canadian contribution to uh, Palestinian dispossession. 
that includes you know Canadians fighting. We need to be charging Canadians who go and kill in Gaza, and they do so openly. We need to be getting rid of. We need to be challenging all these registered charities. Um, uh, currently, even within the current laws, we have all kinds of ways of challenging them, and there's some evidence that we've had some success on that. Uh, but even we should be changing the laws so this is just criminalized. You're not allowed to be a registered charity supporting this wealthy country that has a P GDP per capita equivalent to Canada's. That's an apartheid state uh, uh, committing genocide. Um, we need to be, you know, getting rid of the Canada-Israel free trade agreement. There's all kinds of ways that we need to be uh, shifting. But but we've had some very modest gains from these mobilizations, and we need to continue that. We need to deepen that. Uh, uh, in coming weeks and months. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much, Eve. Now let's hear from our third speaker. Tamara Lawrence is a PhD candidate in global governance at the Vasily School for International Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University. She's a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Canada. She's a member of the No to War. No to NATO Network, and the Global Women for Peace United Against NATO. She is a longtime environmentalist, feminist, and peace activist. Welcome again, Tamara. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you very much to Socialist Action for organizing this webinar. I'm speaking to you tonight from Waterloo, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples of the Grand River. Let me begin by wishing everyone who observes Ramadan, Ramadan Kareem. And it's really great to be on a panel, panel with Rowan and Eve. I've, I've learned a lot. And I would especially like to express my appreciation to Rowan and the Palestinian youth movement for the important and great organizing that they're doing for Gaza across Canada. I have participated in many actions and rallies in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. Um, and like all of you, I am heartbroken by what is happening to the people in Gaza. And like Eve said, it is really hard to process. Um, the organizations that I'm with, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and uh, Freedom Canada, WELP, we stand in solidarity with Palestine. We have organized um, uh, rallies and attended many rallies and we've sent uh, several letters to our Minister of Foreign Affairs and requested a meeting. We've had meetings with MPs um, and uh, we have had petitions and collected signatures. So we are you know, trying to do what we can as well to have a permanent ceasefire and an arms embargo against Israel and also to have a shift um, a dramatic change in course of our foreign policy from a foreign policy that is premised on violence and racism to one on peace and solidarity. So tonight I'd like to talk to you about uh, three things, Israel and the F-35, Israel and NATO, and the connection between uh, the wars in Israel and Ukraine. So first on the F-35, According to the Euromed Human Rights Monitor, as of today, March 14th, there have been over 40,000 Palestinians killed and 74,000 wounded. Um, almost 400,000 homes, buildings, hospitals, university, libraries, and schools have been destroyed or heavily damaged by Israel's bombing. And I'll put a link in the chat for the Euromed Human Rights Monitor uh, Twitter feed so that you can follow them. What is making this widespread death and destruction possible is Israel's use of the F-35 fighter jet fleet. Israel is bombing Gazans, a poor, starving, imprisoned people with the most advanced fighter jet in human history. As you know, Gaza has no military, it has no air force, no fighter jets, no tanks or warships. It has the armed Hamas resistance, the Qassam brigades with their unguided rockets who are re resisting uh, Israel's brutal assault. Um, in fact, it was Israel that was the first country to get the F-35, which is an American stealth fighter jet, through the U.S. foreign uh, U.S. foreign sales program in 2017. Then the following year, in 2018, Israel started to bomb Syria, and in 2021, Israel first used the F-35 to bomb Gaza. 
The F-35 is a warplane that Canada helped to develop with the United States in a consortium of allies since 1997. The F-35 is the costliest weapons program ever at $1.7 trillion over its life cycle. Each warplane costs over $100 million uh, US. It's also a fossil fuel powered fighter jet that is not only killing people, but wrecking the climate and making it impossible for uh, the people of Palestine to have any climate resilience. Um, Israel has three squadrons of this warplane, a total of 50. And last year, the Israeli government announced that it is going to buy another 25 F-35s for a cost of $3 billion. Israel is using uh, military aid that it is getting from the US to buy American warplanes that then bomb Gaza and Syria, and they want to bomb Lebanon and Iran. Last November, and again this January, Israel's extremist heritage minister called for striking the Gaza Strip with a nuclear bomb. Well, last week, the US government announced that the F-35 is certified to carry the B-6112 tactical nuclear bomb. In fact, the F-35 was designed to carry uh, this nuclear bomb. This ongoing genocide in Gaza has a real risk of nuclear escalation. Israel is a nuclear armed state. As you know, it's the only nuclear armed state in the Middle East. And of course, it is a close ally to the US and NATO. And Israel has resisted calls over decades for a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. Yet uh, Israel's uh, recent nuclear sable rattling against Palestine has not been condemned by any Canadian official. And as you know, Canada has done virtually nothing to end the genocide in Gaza. Um, we know that Canada has continued to send weapons and material equipment, um, military equipment to Israel, um, and that it may, and that there may be Canadian manufacturers that are supplying spare parts to um, Israel's fighter jet fleet. Um, I want to bring to your attention the great work of journalist Alex Kosh of The Maple, who did an investigation into Canada's uh, arms exports to Israel since October 6th, 7th, and I'll put a link to his uh, article in the chat as well. Recently, a Dutch, uh, a Dutch court ordered defense manufacturers in the Netherlands from supplying parts to the F-35s in Israel. We need a sim similar court, court order and we need a total arms embargo on Israel. On the F-35s, I also want to add that um, in January of last year, Canada announced that it was going to buy a fleet of F-35s, 88 for a cost of $19 billion. You know, who are we going to strike with those stealth fighters? Um, and these F-35s will be stationed at the Air Force Base in Cold Lake, Alberta. This Air Force Base was built 70 years ago on land stolen from the Dene and Cree people. And this land was under treaty that the federal and provincial governments completely abrogated to build this Air Force Base and a massive air weapons range. In the past three years, I have been to Cold Lake three times. Um, Many Indigenous people are suffering from poverty and addiction because of intergenerational trauma uh, caused by the federal government's dispossession of their land uh, for a military base and also forcing them into residential schools. Uh, the federal government also forces the Indigenous communities in Cold Lake to live under the constant noise of the current fleet of fighter jets, which is the CF-18s, they're flying constantly overhead every day and they're very noisy, but the F-35s are much louder. And no one in the federal government has expressed any concern for the health and uh, welfare of the indigenous people in Cold Lake from uh, this procurement of F-35s. We should not be investing in a new fleet of fighter jets. We should actually be um, terminating the the Air Force Base and the Air Weapons Range and turning that land back over to the Indigenous people. As you know, the first genocide started against the Indigenous people in this country and it is continuing. 
there is a connection between our domestic policy against indigenous people and our violent racist foreign policy against people of the global south. Um, I want to acknowledge that there are many indigenous uh, people and leaders across Canada, like the Mohawk activist uh, from uh, Kanasatagi, Ellen Gabriel, who are standing in solidarity with the people of Palestine. And if you see videos of rallies across Canada, you'll see uh, many uh, Indigenous people at the front uh, for, for Gaza calling for a ceasefire. I also want to talk about the connection between Israel and NATO. In 1987, uh, US President Ronald Reagan designated Israel as a major non-NATO ally. This is a formal designation. It's just under full NATO membership. And this allowed the US and NATO to cooperate more closely with Israel on weapons technology and transfers, and also on counterterrorism. The US brought Israel into NATO um, just as the United States was turning Central America into a killing field, in the 1980s, the U.S. was funding right-wing regimes, arming death squads, torturing, repressing, and murdering community leaders, socialists, peasant movements in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. The U.S. helped the military dictatorship in Guatemala commit a genocide against the indigenous poor in the 1980s. Now, the US and NATO are helping Israel conduct a genocide against the Palestinians. In 1994, NATO established the Mediterranean Dialogue with five countries, including Israel and Jordan, which was supposed to bring stability and region to, um, uh, stability and, re and security to the region, but it has done the exact opposite. In 2016, Israel opened up a mission an office at the NATO headquarters in Brussels to strengthen its ties with the alliance. Uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg ca has called Israel uh, NATO's vital partner in the Middle East many times. Over the past eight years, NATO officials and Israel's leaders have made regular trips back and forth between Brussels and Tel Aviv. Five days after October 7th, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant briefed by video conference the NATO defense ministers on Hamas's attack. And at that time, Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, said, Israel does not stand alone. And then he also said that NATO members would give Israel practical support. And that meant, of course, weapons. Israel's genocide against Gaza is also NATO's genocide against Gaza. It's NATO's war against the Palestinians. And that's why we need to call for NATO with, uh, for Canada to withdraw from NATO and for the alliance to be abolished. Um, there's also a connection between the brutal genocide in Gaza and this horrible war in Ukraine. In both cases, the Canadian government and the mainstream media do not honestly present the history of these conflicts. As you know, the war um, in Gaza did not start on October 7th, and the war in Ukraine did not start on February 24th, 2022. In both cases, Canada is sending weapons and prolonging the wars. In both cases, Canada has special forces in Israel and Ukraine with no parliamentary or public oversight. In both cases, Canada is supporting and arming right-wing extremists, neo-Nazis, we are not defending democracy and protecting sovereignty in these countries. We are supporting fascism. The unifying force here is fascism. Um, I would like to share a quick story about what happened to me two weeks ago in Ottawa. So it was a Thursday morning, really early. There was a, a rally organized uh, for Gaza. It left from at seven o'clock in the morning at the Human Rights Memorial on Elgin Street. So there was a whole bunch of people there and we were marching to the Shaw Center down the road where the Liberals were having a fundraiser. A fundraiser. And I noticed as I was marching with my banner that said, you know, end the genocide, free Palestine. And I was holding it with Stuart Ryan, who is a great uh, labor leader there in the Capitol. Um, I noticed in front of me was, um, was the NTP member of parliament, Charlie Angus. And I called out to him and I said, hey, Charlie, just as we need a ceasefire 
in Gaza and an arms embargo against Israel. We need a ceasefire in Ukraine and an arms embargo. We need to stop sending weapons to Ukraine. And he turned around at me and he said uh, very angrily, and he pointed his finger and he said, uh, don't talk to me about Ukraine. Don't waste my time. If you want the war to end, tell the butcher Putin. I was like, oh, you know, we have a role to play here. You know, we can help end the war. And then we kept marching and he was marching in front of me. And I was thinking, and then I decided to shout out. I said, hey, Charlie, did you know that um, we're arming neo-Nazis in Ukraine? You know, we shouldn't be arming neo-Nazis in Ukraine. And then he turned around and uh, very loudly, and with a lot of aggression, he told me to fuck off three times and he walked away. So we have a lot of work to do with our uh, politicians to get them to understand that that um, guns, that weapons, you know, is just fueling these conflicts and not helping to end them. Um, the uh, it is because of Canada's uh, close relationship with the United States, and it is because of our membership in NATO that we have such a highly militarized economy and such a highly militarized foreign policy and why we are ge supporting genocide in Gaza. And the only way that we're going to change this is if we have a strong anti-war and peace movement in Canada that is linked to people's movements for liberation and justice around the world, including the Palestinian struggle. So I want to urge people to get involved. Um, you can find out more information about what we're doing in a united way at the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network. The website is peaceandjusticenetwork.ca. I also want to encourage you to subscribe to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute's e-newsletter, which comes out a couple of times a month and it's great. Uh, we really need to uh, support each other because we are in a common cause you know, for peace and justice. I also want to encourage everyone to join us in Ottawa on May 29th and May 30th, as we try to shut down CANSEC. This is North America's largest arms fair. Every year, Israel has a big booth and the Israeli weapons manufacturer, Elbit Systems, which has its headquarters in Haifa, they have a big presence at, at CANSEC. So, uh, you know, come out and help us shut down CANSEC, help us block the entrances so that we can, you know, stop the, the arms deals. We are also organizing a big On to Ottawa peace caravan. People are going to be uh, coming from across the country, from coast to coast, from Vancouver to Halifax. They're going to be carpooling, taking the train, converging on the capital to help us shut down CANSEC. This is being uh, led by uh, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and WILP Canada. And you can find out more at our website. And then finally, to let you know that this year, is the 75th anniversary of NATO. And there is going to be a big protest in Washington, DC, outside the NATO summit. Uh, we need to be having protests across Canada too. We need to do everything we can to call for the abolition of NATO and for Canada to withdraw. So I hope to see you at the end of May in Ottawa. Let's uh, block the gates to the arms fair and we can say together, shut down CANSEC, end the genocide in Gaza, free Palestine, and no to NATO, yes to peace. Thanks. Thank you, Tamara. So now we're going to open up to the floor and we I've got some questions in the chat as well for the Q&A. So I'm going to read the first three, going to take the first three from the chat and I will read them slowly so our panelists can, can get them or they can read them in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Julius. Should the Palestine Solidarity Movement be targeting Christian Zionism for its massive role, particularly in the U.S., of shaping and supporting the Israeli state. The second question is from Barry. What do you say about the silence of the Canadian Labour Congress and the open complicity of Jagmeet Singh and the NDP brass with your education of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism? What should be done about that? And the third question, just bear with me, folks. 
I'm so used to having to do this. Yeah. Now I can't get my uh, my cursor to move. I think my my frozen. Carrie, do you have the third question there from Josh that you could read, please? Uh, sure, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Josh asks, what can what can we as socialists be doing to educate people and get them to understand that being pro Palestine and standing up for human rights in Palestine is not anti Semitic? Curious about strategies to educate living in the writing of uh, Wayne Long, who is uh, also a Zionist and has attacked the local Palestinian community. Okay, so that's the three questions. You have up to five minutes to answer one, two, or three. It's up to you, panelists. And we're going to start with Eve, then Tamara, and then uh, Ruan. So go ahead, Eve. Well, first of all, in terms of Christian Zionism, Canada Christian College is in the Toronto area, and that's the uh, 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 Charles uh, McVetty uh, who who leads that. Who is the uh, he he's the preeminent uh, Christian Zionist in in Canada today, and um, they have uh, they host events. Uh, they uh, yeah they're they're a force. So it's worth challenging that. I think it's worth challenging all different uh, sources of uh, of pro genocide, pro apartheid. Um, with regards to the NDP, uh, I think there's like quite interesting uh, dynamics <clears throat> that have played out within the NDP on this question. Uh, as a general rule, NDP foreign policy is not very good, and and it it takes activism to uh, push them into taking sort of okay positions or decent positions. Um, on Palestine, NDP historically was very, even maybe more pro-Israel than the other parties uh, for many years. Um, now that has shifted substantially over the past 20, 30 years. And um, Jagmeet Singh is a, obstacle to that he doesn't represent a he represents the more uh, pro-zionist elements within the ndp um but he has been um he has been forced into uh calling for arms embargo and like literally forced when back in 2021 when the convention passed that resolution against the wishes of the party calling for an arms embargo and then he started raising the question and they've been raising it more uh recently they now, I think, see the uh, political upside, uh, particularly with the Muslim community um, on this question. And obviously the whole sort of what would be viewed as the traditional base of the NDP has become uh, very uh, uh, active against the genocide. Um, so, so, but at the same time, he still follows Singh. The most egregious uh, recent example was the um, emergency march against the uh, attack on Rafa. I guess that's maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, and where a, a Spider Man for Palestine got up on the uh, the ledge of the uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And waved a Palestinian flag, and the the usual uh, uh, anti-Palestinian groups decided that this was uh, tied to the hospital being uh, set up as a, a Jewish hospital a hundred years ago, and made all kinds of outrageous claims um, that had no basis in fact. And uh, Singh basically followed followed the um, the. Uh, the Israel lobby in in smearing this demonstration, uh, even though it's all been shown how ridiculous it all was, and has refused to back away from it. So so they they they're kind of like make a step forward. The NDP is in the making step forward. Uh, they have this resolution, uh, this this uh, debate uh, on Monday in the House of Commons, and um, they're a whole their opposition day to focused on a bunch of issues around Palestine, which is a step in the right direction, uh, but. So they go sort of one step forward, two steps forward, maybe, and then kind of throw a bone to the to the Israel lobby and all their uh, their smears. Um, and that gets into kind of the part of the other question about the whole anti-Semitism thing. And the, it's a really powerful stick 
like we have to be really clear about this, right? Like I, I just I just published a piece that goes over the why on Canada's support for Zionism. Uh, and there's a geostrategic element, there's a Christian Zionist element, there is a settler solidarity element, there is a, uh, a Jewish um, a Zionist uh, 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 organization and, and power structure element. And then, and then kind of aligned with that is the anti-Semitism stick. And it's a, it's a stick that has been just trotted out just so aggressively, unabashedly over the past uh, five months, but um, and and it's diminishing returns. That's clear, but but it still does have uh, effect. And Jagmeet Singh, you know, joining the Israel lobby's uh, outrageous claims about uh, Spider Man for Palestine and standing up in a hospital and waving a flag um, is it speaks to that. And and it, and it has a effect of 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 of, um, of basically scaring. I think particularly the sort of like intelligentsia, um, you know, there has been 25 weekends in a row, I believe it is, it's 24, 25 weekends in a row of, of demonstrations in Montreal. There are other cities. As far as I know, the only time uh, an MP or even a member of the provincial legislatures showed up, Matthew Green showed up at, at one of the demonstrations in Toronto and I believe he may have also showed up in Ottawa. Um, a Quebec Solidaire uh, member, uh, MA member of the National Assembly showed up, at least one showed up at, uh, at the one of the biggest ones here in Montreal. Now, in, 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 in both of those occasions, Matthew Green had to put out a statement afterwards, uh, uh, basically saying, distancing himself from some comment that someone made at the march you know, there's thousands or even tens of thousands there and somebody said something and I don't even remember what the details were, but it was framed as please, Jewish, whatever. Please, please, please. And yeah, so and so that 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 gets used. And so same thing would have the same dynamic happened in the Quebec Soda MA. So 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 the point is is that that stick continues to have this really um de 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 the deterrence it, it has towards people in any position of, of authority aligning with an anti-genocide, anti-apartheid position is still quite substantive. I, I don't know really any way to deal with it except for just plowing forward, um, but it is, is quite powerful. Okay. Tamara? Five minutes. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, just um, a few things. So in terms of educating people, uh, Hosting events, sharing resources, uh, is are you know are things that we need to be doing. You know, helping to educate each other. Um, I think it's really great that the Palestinian youth movement has been hosting all of these teach-ins and um, in communities across the country. Webinars like this are you know super important. Um, I do recall the NDP MP Matthew Green being with uh, being at a rally for um, um, with Palestinian families up in Ottawa uh, who had um, held a three day, like all day um, protest in front of Parliament Hill, you know, calling for reunification for their families uh, family members to get out of Gaza and um, you know to be able to to, to come through the the, the refugee uh, program and, but there's uh, so many challenges and Canada isn't letting uh, Palestinians in the country uh, not in the same way that it's it let uh, Ukrainian refugees come into the country um, you know another example of our racist foreign policies um, I, uh, you know, I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about you know, the state of our politics in this country and the fact that we really don't have any political party, any member of parliament who we can work with closely on all of these issues. You know, someone like a Claire Daly in the European parliament or, or, um, um, or Jeremy Corbyn in the uh, uh, British Parliament, 
Uh, I think we really need, I, I think we need to start thinking about trying to get someone in, in Ottawa. And I have, I've been really thinking about, yeah, just if, if we could all rally around someone and, and, and get them, get them in. I think that we need to get rid of, rid of most of our members of parliament. We're, ha we're going to have an election in about a year and a half. And, and there's, you know, there's so few that are are fit for office, and I, I think that we need to start planning now to have a, a massive overhaul of, of parliament. And I, I'm I'm hoping that the Palestinian youth movement can really help with this. We need to get the Liberals and the Conservatives, most of the NDPs, um, 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 out, and uh, um, and you know the Greens. I I'm not happy with at all on on Ukraine, for instance. Uh, and some inspiration, of course, is George Galloway, who just got elected for Rochdale in in the UK. And he's, you know, back in Parliament. I mean, it's just incredible. I think it's really great. We, we need to start translating our, our grassroots struggle into political power. Um, and then uh, this, this is a little bit related. You know, we're using social media a lot for educating each other. But right now, before Parliament, there's a bill, Bill C-63, the Online Harms Act, that is going to allow the federal government to, to moderate, to manage content on the internet and on these uh, social media platforms. And this is coming at a time, the same time that the United States and the European Mo Union are passing similar laws. And of course, it's very much motivated by... by um, you know, what young people, for instance, are able to access on TikTok and Instagram about what is happening in Gaza. We are watching a genocide unfold, you know, through social media. And now we've got this bill in Parliament that's going to try to, to limit what we see and know. They're able to do this on the war in Ukraine, but they haven't been able to do this with uh, the genocide in Gaza. So uh, we really need to push back in so many different ways. And... Um, yeah, th those are just uh, some thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Veron. Veron. Yeah, thanks so much, y'all. Those were great responses. Um, I'll be really quick with my response because y'all covered a lot of um, the things I was thinking, but something in terms of Christian Zionism is there's a lot of different pieces just in terms of like how we've been thinking about um, really a agitating people so when we're thinking about agitating people in churches, for instance, we're really trying to get, you know, some churches on our side and there's multiple organizations that do this kind of work. So pr primarily in Kitchener, Waterloo, we've had the Palestinian youth movement go to different churches like the United Church or what have you and have been really um, agitating them on how to speak about Palestine, how to engage on uh, the question of Palestine and how to engage in um, how we understand the current genocide. And so I think there's like, I know the question is about Christian Zionism, but I think there's two pronged approaches in terms of how we approach um, churches, generally speaking, get folks on our side and agitate through that. And then in terms of Christian Zionism to what folks had already responded is that, you know, we are obviously going to be putting pressure on um, all of the forces of Zionism, wherever they exist, however they exist. But I think just in terms of like, how do we organize the masses and how do we get people on our side? That is a great way to kind of um, almost infiltrate into churches and make sure that um, all of these different places are really on side. And then the other piece on, you know, the anti-Semitism, I think, just like you said, like, it's a powerful tool and they've been using it consistently. But I will say that their propaganda has been getting weaker and weaker. And, you know, they've been really just harping on anti-Semitism to a point where you could even say the word Palestine and they would um, call this anti-Semitic. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of different um, Jewish organizers, namely in like IJV, Independent Jewish Voices or JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, or right now the coalition, um, the um, Jews, Jews say no to genocide have been really doing a lot of analysis on like what it means to weaponize anti-Semitism, how have they understood those different pieces and how this is kind of um, not just, you know, something that is um, like it's basically on a state and institutional level that this weaponization of anti-Semitism has occurred. And so I think just to what Eve said, as well as like push through it, but also there's like the what I was speaking to at the very beginning, the materialist understanding of how we push against this idea of like 
it's a religious conflict or this is anti-Semitic or what have you. It's to really root us in the fact that this has been ongoing for over a hundred years. And like when we're thinking about, you know, some of the history that folks had also shared, it's it didn't start in 1948 either. There was, you know, um, British colonialism in 1917 and then the Balfour Declaration and all of these different pieces. And there has been over a hundred years of resistance as well. So when we're thinking about a hundred years of colonialism, or hundred years of imperialist violence, we're also looking at a hundred years of resistance. So I think it's important to kind of see that any form of resistance or when we are speaking out is not particularly too, um, you know, just, it, it's not anti-Semitic because we are speaking about the 100 years that has been um, the colonial violence that we've experienced as Palestinians, whether it be under a British mandate or whether it be under a Jewish supremacist uh, force. Okay, thank you. So now we'll go to the audience and take a couple and then back to the chat. So Flo, three minutes to ask your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you to all the speakers. It's been really great so far. Um, I was struck, Rowan, when you said that, uh, you know, something like Palestine is shouldering the the burden of resistance and the revolutionary burden of resistance. You know, I think that's definitely the case. Um, I wish it weren't. Uh, but, you know, it makes me think of how we often hear kind of um, Palestine is like a cornerstone issue in left politics. There's a lot about it that's it has a lot of elements, almost like a microcosm of, you know, global class struggle and anti-imperialism and uh, decolonization. Uh, you know, and, and that, again, makes me think of the the real imperialist origins of Israel, um, which, you know, I've been learning a lot more about through sessions like this and folks um, through socialist action and uh, Palestinian youth uh movement and everything uh and yeah so i'd like to get your thoughts i guess or what do you think about the internationalist component of it because it also makes uh me think of communists in world war one uh with the advent of world war one and how at least the principled socialists would connect the dots between you know fighting big capital or uh oppression under capitalism and imperialism and the you know forever war machine uh there's obvious you know geopolitical significance i think which was uh mentioned to the uh palestinian conflict as well the genocide that's happening the establishment of zionist israel so how can we perhaps use anti-imperialism anti-capitalism internationalism how do these struggles relate and how can we try to empower both at the same time? Uh, what are your thoughts on that generally? Are there tensions that we should watch out for? Uh, me, I'm optimistic that it, if we get it right, it, it could be a real turning point in the, uh, you know, socialist movements worldwide. Uh, but I don't know. So I'd love to hear more. Okay, Judy, your question, please. Okay, I'm going to move on then to a question in the chat while Judy is trying to get her microphone on. Uh, the question from the chat is, uh, Galloway was recently elected in the UK. He is a vocal supporter of Palestine and also socially conservative. Today, he does not consider himself, himself of the left. What impact do you think his election will have on the Palestine solidarity movement and on the traditional left in the West. And I'll go to Judy for the third question. Judy? Uh, okay. What is the relationship between the way that, that the native people have been treated and the, uh, and the treatment of Palestinians? If you can go, go briefly into that, if you can. Okay, so you've heard the three questions. I will give each panelist up to four minutes to answer one, two, or three. And we're going to start this time with Tamara, then Eve, then uh, Rowan, and then Eve. 
Tamara? So the victory by George Galloway in the UK re-entering British Parliament is an inspiration to us all. I remember organizing about 15 years ago a big event in Halifax for George. He was speaking out against the wars in um, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he was also talking about Palestine. Uh, and it's uh, he he is called for uh, he's he, he's he's running under I think it's called the the, uh, the Workers Party or something like that in the UK, and he's called for. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, to join him and big and build a big uh, movement, a big political movement in the country. And I think that they can, they can replicate something like that, a momentum. And I think that this should give us an idea uh, for what we might be able to do in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, I would love to see progressive people on this call uh, uh, running and for us to be really strategic about it, you know, really to try to help get a couple of of, of, you know, just put all of our resources in to get a couple of really good people in Parliament uh, to get these Liberals and Conservatives out. Um, and, uh, 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 oh, there was something, oh, about uh, about Indigenous people. I, I, I just want to uh, tell you a, a little bit about going up to Cold Lake and, and what I saw. So, you know how, um, well, you know how in um, you know what the I Israel has done to the Palestinian land, you know, disconnected it. Like there's all of these little enclaves. They don't have highways and um, or roads to connect them. And, you know, this is purposeful. It's it's a strategy of, of d divide and conquer. Well, it's replicated on what we did to indigenous people in, in Canada. And it's what I see in Cold Lake. There are three indigenous communities that are separated by long distances around the military base. And in these communities, they don't even have, most of the communities don't have paved roads, but the military base has these nice new roads and nice new buildings and a healthcare clinic and school and everything. There isn't a tribal school in Cold Lake for the indigenous people. There aren't you know paved roads and there's very, very little for them and for the for their children and you know this is horrendous it, it, it's it's very similar in it uh, to me and like i said many of the houses are not in very good condition and the people the people are suffering the people are suffering you can you can see it and our country is going to be spending you know 19 billion dollars to buy fighter jets when the indigenous communities in cold lake have unsafe housing and poor roads and very little services. And so many indigenous communities, you know, are still under boiled water, boil water advisories. You know, this is just an outrage. This is such an injustice. Uh, we are investing so much money in militarism. Our military spending has gone up 95% in the past nine years from $21, bi $20 billion dollars to uh, $36 billion. And um, and if we were to reach the NATO 2% target in the next few years, we're looking at a military budget of you know, upwards of $55, $60 billion a year. So friends, uh, you know, we have got to work together on this. We have got to stop this militarism. We have got to reduce military spending, cut it, and we need to reallocate it to peace, diplomacy, investing in all of the needs that we have in this country, affordable housing, climate action, healthcare, education, indigenous reconciliation. Rowan? Yeah, thanks so much, Tamara. That was excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna collapse the two questions that Flo asked, as well as the question that Judy asked into one. Um, something that we uphold consistently within the PYM is this idea of joint struggle. And, you know, when we're talking about joint struggle, we're not talking about like, you know, good or bad solidarity or like trying to move from bad solidarity to good solidarity. But it's more so like, how do we understand our struggles as interconnected? How do we understand them as one in the same? And how do we understand that we are fighting really the same imperialist violence? And so when we're thinking about that, we really uphold something that 
um, the martyr Hassan Kenafani had said, and he had said the um, imperialism has laid its body all over the world. Wherever you strike it, you damage it and you serve the world revolution. And that's kind of something we consistently uphold, whether it comes to, you know, joint struggle or internationalism. And this is true of how we understand our relationship and kinship towards indigenous peoples on this land or across the border, so-called border. Um, and it's to say that, you know, we uphold all forms of internationalism in the way that we understand that even though our struggles are not exactly the same and we're looking at different timelines of settler colonialism um, and we're looking at different timelines of imperialist violence as well, we are still um, connecting in the different ways and really operating materially. So when we're thinking about joint struggle, it's really a material relationship and it's really building these relationships in a way that isn't transactional. So we're never going to be like, you know, when we're understanding internationalism or upholding internationalism materially, it's not going to be a situation where we are scratching the backs of our comrades and they are scratching our backs. It's more so we are here in this together and we are ultimately fighting um, these different things together. And so, um, yeah, a lot of the ways that we've done that is to really um, like a build those strong relationships with different folks across the city, whether it be indigenous peoples um, who are organizing on this land, or whether it be we have really close relationships with um, our Filipino comrades in Anakbayan, for instance. And you know we do teach-ins together, we host different um, events together, and it's not just really hosting these different things; it's really building those relationships and building that understanding um, that is really rooted in how we understand this international approach that we're doing. So just one example that I can give um, is that recently uh, Anak Bayan, as well as a bunch of other uh, Filipino organizations came together to, and they realized, you know, they made an assessment that their community is not as mobilized on Palestine as it needs to be in this moment. And so they, they held an entire event um, to mobilize their community. And it was particularly for Filipinos to come together to speak about what is happening and really engage in those different pieces. And it was all very successful. And I think these are the kinds of relationships that we're building. It's not, again, like hosting just events or, you know, engaging with an, one another and like hanging out or what have you. Those are parts of those relationship building, but it's also to say, okay, how does the Palestinian understand the Filipino condition? And how does how do Filipinos understand the Palestinian condition? And then really agitating our communities on those different pieces in order to really um, push our struggles forward. Okay, thank you, Rowan. I wanna let everybody know that Rowan might have to go soon because as some of you don't know, she had to fill in at the last moment for her comrade who had an emergency. So thank you very much for being here with us and giving up your time and uh, you can leave or stay whenever you need to. Okay, thank you. Eve, you have four minutes. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I think that <clears throat> George Galloway's victory is definitely, definitely a positive thing. Um, it, it is a sign that there is a lot of support, even in the electoral arena, uh, for a Palestine. Uh, simultaneously, we had the vote in Michigan where in the primary, Democratic primary, uh, more than 100,000 uh, voted uncommitted, uh, which was a movement uh, pushed uh, by uh, Palestine solidarity. Um, and my understanding is, is that Washington state, they just had to vote and the uncommitted number was quite high too. Um, so so uh, I think we should be I don't know if I necessarily agree with uh, Tamara about putting our resources in to get individuals elected. I, I think that might be a complicated um, question, but I actually think we should be putting resources into defeating liberal MPs specifically over their um, anti-Palestinian policies. And I, I just wrote about that. And I, I think that there probably there are, um, five or six, you know, in every major city, choose one riding that has, um, if it was a close race, if it if it's a liberal NDP race, uh, there'll be some demographic questions if it, you know, has a, a significant Arab Muslim uh, voting, uh, uh, you know, percentage. 
uh, are there some other questions that would go into what the exact writings are, but to do a negative campaign. And it started, some of that started here in Montreal with uh, Stephen Guilbeault, the writing where I am, people are starting to put up signs about Guilbeault's uh, uh, complicity and to start really a hard, hard negative campaign against the MPs uh, for, for their contribution um, to uh, the, the, the uh, genocide. Um, now, if I understand the other question, one of the other questions um, properly, it's like, what's the political fallout from all of this? Um, the, the left is not in, in, in the main European, North American world, the left isn't very strong. Uh, I think maybe with the exception of uh, Latin America, I don't think anywhere in the world right now, the left is, is particularly um, strong. Um, so is it realistic that in the you know, short, medium term, that we're going to lead to you know, serious um, anti-systemic, anti-capitalist uh, kind of movements that come out of this? Probably not. Um, I do think that there are particularly uh, younger people who are appalled by the fact that the media, the major politicians have all sort of been complicit in this. And I think there's a lot of people um, kind of questioning the system based upon this. Uh, they, you know, on one hand, you see these horrors, the videos of horrors happening in Gaza. On the other hand, you see uh, these politicians and the whole dominant media accepting that and promoting that essentially. Um, so so I, I think from an internationalist Canadian perspective, I think that this has done more to uh, put into question the whole notion of benevolent Canadian foreign policy than anything else I've ever seen. Um, so, and I, I don't think that's going to end even, you know, let's One hope that, left. let's hope that the, the killing ends as soon as possible. Uh, but I don't think that people are just going to forget in six months, a year, two years, five years, um, what, what Canadian politicians and the Canadian state have, have enabled. So I think there are going to be, uh, uh, you know, rever political reverberations from this, 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 this horror um, but I, I think at this point, of course, it's, it's too, too early to know. Um, I think that the, uh, the anti-war movement, which was very weak, if you go six months ago, the anti-war movement in this country was very weak. It has been bolstered, not as much as I would have liked, of course, but it has been bolstered. Um, where all this goes, I, I don't know. Uh, please unmute uh, Elizabeth. Sorry, folks. Yeah, so we've run out of time, but I'm going to take one more round of, of uh, questions. And I have uh, Anz, and then I have uh, a question from Flo and one and Barry. So I'm going to read the first question, and then I will go to Anz, and I will go to Barry, and make your questions as quickly as you can. The first one is, what do you think about a two-state solution? I'm pretty sure I know. What are what are you going to what are you your go-to arguments when advancing the notion of a secular democratic state? What do you say to the refrain? Refrain: Neither side wants that. Okay, so that's the first question. Now I'm going to go to Anz. My question was uh, for Ravan, and she's left, so it's moot. I'll pass. Okay, Barry? Yeah, I want to thank all the participants for a really scintillating uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, it's been a terrific uh, presentation and I'm so glad it was recorded and will be posted. My question is about relationships inside the, uh, and across the Middle East and beyond. I think it's clear that the Arab and Muslim governments have been 
with the exception of the Houthis of Yemen and Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, have been complicit with the Zionist state. Um, and I think this issue should be should be should be addressed. Doesn't this demonstrate the need? I would argue for a permanent revolution that is a struggle for socialism across the region to overcome all the collaborators with imperialism and its agents. This is not a, this is not an argument for neutrality in relation to the traitors to the Palestinian cause, but uh, to rearm ourselves with the, th the political theory needed to uh, build a movement, um, uh, not only <laughs> to end the war, but to uh, end the, uh, the, the genocide, but to move forward to end the collaborators with imperialism and its agents. I would argue this is realism uh, with, without which oppression and misery cannot end. That's my question. Thanks a lot. Okay, the last question goes to Julius. You have three minutes. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I have a, a comment and a question. Um, so my question about Galloway um, really is, is a result of his trajectory. So there's no doubt in my mind that he has a long history of anti-imperialism and, and he's solid on that and he has been for a long time. However, I think that uh, it's important to acknowledge that uh, George Galloway does not today, he does not consider himself of the left. He is socially conservative. And I would encourage people to listen to Glenn Greenwald's most recent podcast. And it's made clear. I mean, he, he says it himself. So my question is, was around, well, what impact does that have on the socialist left in the West and, and around the world? But I'll, I'll leave it there. My question is, um, in terms of anti-imperialism, anti there's an idea out there that Russia and China uh, are challenging U.S. hegemony. So I'd like to know why, if that's the case, why doesn't Russia or China just simply fill up some of their ships, uh, bring some of their warships, you know, land their 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 cargo ships right onto the shore of Gaza, filled with food and uh, the resources that the gas the people of Gaza need in order to survive. Why don't they just do that? I mean, why doesn't China just do that today? Um, what's what's stopping China from doing something like that? Because um, it seems to me that if it, they these um, governments are in fact, you know, real challengers to U.S. hegemony, when the U.S. and Israel is as unpopular as it is around the world today, that this would be the perfect opportunity. Uh, for both of those nations, not only to exert their own power and influence, but to gain in popularity around the world uh, for defying uh, this, you know, genocide and the support of the United States and, and its absolute complicity in this genocide. Okay, thank you, Julius. So we're going to go back to our two panelists and you have three minutes. I know it's not much time, but that's what's left. Three minutes each, and we will start with Tamara. Um, on the issue of uh, a two-state solution, one-state solution, I will leave the bulk of that answer to Eve, some, some of my time uh, to Eve, but I will bring to your attention this excellent book written in 2007 by Gada Karmi, a Palestinian act, uh, academic uh, called Married to Another Man, uh, Israel's dilemma in Palestine, and it makes the case for a one-state solution. And uh, it's it's an excellent book. And on uh, uh, Russia and China, well, Russia has been hosting meetings with all of the Palestinian leaders in in Moscow to try to to reach a solution. If you follow China, for instance, at the United Nations Security Council, it's been strongly advocating for an end to the to the genocide in in Gaza and the war in Ukraine, it has offered peace solutions. It has offered uh, to to you know to mediate to end these conflicts. Uh, I have traveled extensively in the past two years in developing countries across uh, in in Egypt and in Dubai, and then I also did a big tour of Russia, Finland, Latvia, Poland, and Romania. And I can assure you that the, the Global South, and I've been interacting with thousands of activists from across the Global South at the climate summits for the past three years. And I can assure you that the, major that the majority of the Global South is on the side of Russia and China and, um, and, and believe that these countries are uh, you know, trying to work for a 
more just uh, multipolar world. Um, it, we, I think that we live in a uh, this this Western uh, bubble, and we, we you know don't hear the, the the views of of the global South very often. And it was you know their their support um, for China and Russia is uh, is very clear. When I was in Dubai, for instance, Putin came, and the entire city had all of the billboards were Russia today. They completely rolled, uh, rolled out the, the red carpet and activists at the climate summit were very, were, uh, you know, were very positive towards China and Russia. So, um, and then I, I want to just finally bring to your attention, if you, ha if you aren't aware of this, this uh, document that China and Russia released three weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine, and it's called the joint statement of the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China on the international relations entering a new era and the global uh, sustainable development. It really is a blueprint for what China and Russia want for, you know, for peace, for security, for the sustainable development uh, program. This was like Russia's last call to, uh, to, 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 to not have this war in Ukraine. So, um, I just wanted to share those thoughts, and uh, I'll let Eve take the uh, the other questions. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, when it when it comes to the Arab Arab countries and their continued relations, it is pretty remarkable that the countries are normalized. They haven't they haven't, uh, despite the just you know horrors, that hasn't changed. Right? Uh, there's been very very minimal. Uh, Condemnation, even, uh, you know. So, this, but I mean, there's been the condemnation, but there's very minimal action. That's pretty remarkable. It speaks to how uh, subservient the Arab regimes are to Washington. It speaks to how well Israel and Washington have divided the region. Um, and I actually think that the the question about you know China and Russia. Uh, is partly tied to that. You know, Saudi Arabia would not be happy if they did something like that, right? If they said, if if Russia or China uh, um, sent boats that sort of, you know, was used as sort of provocative from Israel's perspective. Uh, and the other regimes, I don't think would necessarily be happy either. So, so the the population would be, and the Arab world is, is very clear. Um, but the power structures would not necessarily be, and the power structures, because the power structures are so intertwined with Israel and the US. Now, having said all that, said, having said that, I also, I don't think, and you know, this is kind of you know, tied to, I don't, I don't, I think that China's rise is invariably leading to a more multipolar world. Um, and I think there's some, some very good elements within that. Uh, I don't believe that the Chinese government or the Russian government are, um, they, these, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't the kind of people that have been running uh, Cuba or, or Venezuela, right? This is, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, these are people who are, you know, capitalistic, militaristic, nationalistic, you know, um, so, so, uh, you know, they didn't, I mean, even, even in, beyond doing something like sending naval vessels, I mean, it was South Africa that launched the legal battle, right? From my understanding, Russia and China, you know, I, they may have finally come out in favor of, of South Africa's uh, uh, case to the International Court of Justice. But if they did, it, they came out very late and, and, you know, after many other countries. So they're not even willing to sort of like, you know, do that. Um, so I, I don't, <clears throat> I, I, you know, from a Palestinian perspective, you know, Israel is a powerful country, right? And Russia and China have, you know, significant ties with Israel, right? Israel is a, is a very um, important uh, high tech, often arms, uh, in, you know, security kind of stuff uh, um, that they sell to lots of countries. Um, so 
you know, Russia has this whole thing with Israel that's tied to Israel bombing Syria and Russia being there. And there's kind of an interesting game going on there where Israel, the Russians let the Israelis bomb in, in Syria and because they have some of their uh, uh, um, their anti-missile machines, the S-300, I believe maybe the S-400 that's there. Um, so, so, you know, I don't, I don't think that um, Russia and China are really operating based upon uh, world public opinion. They're operating based upon, you know, economic and other geostrategic interests. And, and the Palestinians have never had much power. They've had a lot of, they've had a lot of um, international sympathy, but they haven't ever really had power. And so countries that operate based upon um, you know, what's in it for them and power um, aren't going to tend to do much uh, for, um, uh, for, uh, for the Palestinians. Okay. Thanks very much to our panelists, Rowan, uh, Eve, and Tamara. And of course, also a special thanks to Kiri, our technical producer, and to Barry, the political producer of the series of the webcasts. So please consider being a supporter of Socialist Action News Report and the SA Monthly Magazine, The Red Review, which we will send to you online. Just have to fill out the form. Visit our website, www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to join Socialist Action, write to socialistactioncanada.gmail.com or just give us a call, 647-986-1917. This show has been recorded and will be posted onto the Socialist Action YouTube channel. The next essay webcast is Thursday, March the 28th, and it is titled The Greatest Propaganda Lies. Hmm, sounds interesting. It will feature speakers Flo Sherrod in Terrace, BC, and SA Federal Secretary Barry Weisletter and Anz Modlik in Toronto. That is taking place on Thursday, March the 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The Zoom link is posted on the SA website. In the meantime, please be safe, stay healthy, and stay active. Bye for now. <laughs>